Not all diamonds are born from deep earth mines. Some of them are resting quietly in the same rivers you've passed by a thousand times. They're not sparkling under sunlight like in the jewelry store. No, they're hiding in plain sight, masked by mud, rough edges, and the river's gentle flow. But if you know the secrets, the signs, and the subtle shifts in the land and water, they become visible. This isn't a fantasy. This is the real science of finding alluvial diamonds. Nature's rarest treasures, scattered by time and carried by ancient river systems. So how do you turn a casual walk by a river into a journey that may end with holding a rough diamond worth thousands? Let's dive into the untold clues. We begin with ancient riverbeds, not just any river. Diamonds don't move alone. They're heavy, denser than almost any other mineral, and they only settle where nature drops its load. Look for old channels, where the river used to flow thousands or millions of years ago. These are called paleo channels. Often invisible to the untrained eye, they can be revealed by satellite imagery, unnatural elevation dips, or clusters of unusually rounded gravel. But to the eye of a trained prospector, these aren't just old riverbeds, they're natural gold mines. Or more accurately, diamond mines in disguise. Now what lies within these ancient channels? Heavy mineral traps. Picture a river slowing down suddenly, at a bend behind a large rock or where a steep drop levels out. That's where diamonds stop traveling. Alongside them, garnet, ilmenite, magnetite, black sand. These are your indicators and they rarely lie. If you're seeing a buildup of dense black sand or dark pebbles clustered together in one pocket, you're standing near a natural riffle, nature's sluice box. But how do you tell what's merely a heavy stone and what could be a raw diamond? A real diamond in the wild will not look like a crystal clear gem. It may be cloudy, slightly yellow, or grayish. It won't sparkle, but it might show a greasy luster, a type of shine unlike quartz. It won't feel glassy, it feels gritty. Often octahedral in shape, with flat faces and pointed edges, it looks strangely geometric. But what separates it most is its weight. Pick it up, it feels dense, not heavy like iron, just oddly weighty for its size. Another trick? Look near kimberlite indicator minerals. If you find purple pie rope garnets or green olivine scattered near a riverbed, you're getting closer. These minerals erupt from the same deep volcanic pipes that birth diamonds. When erosion takes over, the diamonds travel. But these indicators travel with them. So follow the signs upstream, because somewhere along that path, the diamonds stopped. Let's not forget Cratons, the ancient geological shields where Earth's crust has remained stable for billions of years. Africa, Brazil, India, parts of the U.S. These regions are prime diamond zones because they preserve the deep mantle conditions that produce diamonds. And if a river intersects a craton zone and carries the signs of erosion from volcanic pipes, you may be standing in one of the rarest geological crossroads, a place where diamonds not only formed, but were freed into the wild. But what about the human element? Prospectors who walk rivers with trained eyes don't just spot diamonds, they predict them. They study erosion lines, sediment layers, and pebble arrangements. They understand that the largest diamonds are often found where the current is slow and the smallest ones get carried further downstream. And they don't rush. Patience is their greatest tool. Because finding a diamond in a river is not about luck, it's about knowledge. Let's now move from still bends to confluent zones where two rivers meet. These spots are turbulent zones where materials collide, settle, and sometimes get trapped between the shifting forces of water. Diamonds get stuck here, wedged between boulders or deep in crevices under gravel bars. If you flip over large rocks in these areas and find tightly packed dark gravels, dig deeper. Let's also decode the visual traps. If you see an area of the river that contains large amounts of iron-stained rocks, oxidized surfaces, or red clay pockets, don't ignore it. These are signs of long-standing mineral deposition zones. Diamonds often settle in the same regions where iron oxidizes and forms heavy clay beds. If it looks ugly, muddy, and mineral-rich, it might just be hiding something valuable beneath. 
Don't be afraid to cut open gravel pockets using nothing but your hands and a flat tool. You'll be surprised how often people walk over tiny clusters of pebbles thinking it's just dirt, while one inch beneath, a two-carat raw diamond has rested for thousands of years. The next crucial factor is the type of host rock surrounding the river. Are you in a region rich in kimberlite or lamproat? Are the gravels angular or well-rounded? Diamonds can only travel so far before they settle. If the gravels are rounded and polished, the source might be far away. If they are jagged and sharp, you might be near the original point of release. Elevation changes in rivers are also clues. Waterfalls, rapids, and sudden drops act as natural classifiers. Diamonds drop here, while lighter materials keep flowing. If you locate a plunge pool beneath a small waterfall, check the deepest pockets. That's where the heaviest particles live. And here's something most prospectors ignore. Night prospecting. Yes, using UV lights or flashlights at low angles. Some diamonds fluoresce under UV light. Some reveal greasy sheens that stand out in artificial lighting. Don't underestimate this low-tech trick. It's helped veteran hunters spot things even trained geologists missed in broad daylight. Even animal behavior can be a clue. Birds often peck at shiny materials in the shallows. If you find an area where birds cluster and inspect rocks in shallow water, check there. Their instincts are ancient and their vision is often sharper than ours. To truly master the art of field detection, you need to read texture. Not all gravels are equal. Look closely. If you start finding a mixture of water-worn and angular stones, that's a transition zone. Diamonds are often discovered in these mixed layers, especially where modern erosion intersects ancient deposits. In simple terms, you're witnessing time clash against time, and somewhere in that collision, a diamond may be sleeping. Have you ever noticed brown pebbles with small black specks stuck in thick clay? Most overlook them. But those pebbles are sometimes diamond-bearing conglomerates, ancient stone beds cemented by pressure and mineral content. If you split them open and reveal crystalline interiors or dense carbon spots, you're digging in the right strata. Let's dig deeper into indicator minerals, because these are your true compass in the wild. Beyond garnets and olivine, rivers also carry chromite, ilmenite, and spinel, each of which suggests nearby kimberlite sources. In fact, many successful alluvial diamond finds started with someone noticing nothing but strange red or dark metallic grains lodged between quartz pebbles. Those grains were garnet fragments from a kimberlite explosion. Follow that trail, and it could lead you to a cache of ancient wealth. But how do you even begin to find a diamond in rivers outside of known zones? Here's where things get really fascinating. Diamonds can also arrive in rivers through erosion of glacial till or from uplifted tectonic activity. What does this mean? It means that even in countries with no modern diamond mines, rivers may carry ancient fragments left behind by glaciers or deep earth volcanic activity long since eroded. And this opens a secret. Remote and unexplored rivers are sometimes more promising than famous mining streams. Why? Because they've been untouched, undisturbed, and where human footprints haven't sifted the gravel, opportunity still sleeps. When you get to a promising spot, your best tool is not a machine. It's a shovel and a gold pan. Yes, that same pan used for gold can help you spot diamonds. Because while diamonds are not metallic, they sink like gold. After swirling the water away, examine what's left in the heavies layer. Look for translucent, angular, greasy-looking stones. Use a loop or magnifying lens and light from the side to look for the telltale octahedral shape. Also, never ignore the sound of the gravel. Strange tip? Maybe, but prospectors have noticed that true diamond gravel has a distinct heaviness when you scoop it with a metal shovel. It feels more resistant, denser. A seasoned ear, surprisingly, can sense when they're hitting a rich patch. Now, if you've ever been in a muddy, mineral-stained creek and thought, there's no way anything valuable is down there, think again. Diamonds don't choose beauty when they hide. They favor chaos. They hide in iron-rich clays, under moss-covered boulders, inside log jams, and in erosion gullies. Places no one wants to dig because they seem unpromising or difficult. But nature rewards those who go beyond the easy surface. Diamonds are found in trouble spots, places where water slows, turbulence ends, and time settles. And here's an even deeper layer of truth. Vegetation can help. Yes, plants. 
Grasses that favor iron-rich soil often grow near heavy mineral zones. Mosses and reeds take root in sediment that holds on to heavies. If you see persistent plant life along a slow bend where gravels change color, dig beneath the roots. It's often untouched ground, rich in compacted deposits. But don't forget, this isn't just a science, it's an art. Prospecting rivers for diamonds is more about pattern recognition and instinct than technology. It's walking the same 100 meters five times and noticing something different on the sixth. A triangular pebble you missed before. A sudden shift in pebble color. A glitter of sunlight on a greasy, semi-translucent stone. That could be a rough diamond. Still unsure? Here's one last field trick. Take the suspect stone and rub it lightly against a piece of corundum, like sapphire. If it scratches sapphire, you might be holding a diamond. But don't rely solely on scratch tests. Specific gravity tests, grease tables, and eventually professional inspection are the gold standards. But out in the field, your eyes, hands, and intuition are your strongest instruments. And while finding gold is satisfying, finding a natural diamond in the wild is life-changing. Because it's not just wealth, it's a story. A geological miracle that began hundreds of kilometers below Earth's crust blasted out through a kimberlite pipe, carried by wind, water, and erosion for thousands of years, only to land softly in the shallows of a quiet stream, waiting, waiting for someone who knows what to look for. Maybe someone like you. So the next time you're walking beside a slow-moving river, stepping across black sands and skipping pebbles, pause, look closer, because hidden among the shadows and shimmer just beneath your feet, might be a fragment of Earth's deepest, rarest secret. You don't need to be a miner, you just need to pay attention. Don't forget to subscribe and uncover the unseen.